Fan Voyage 2, Destination Brain By Isaac Asimov Audiobook 19 of 26 Even if the thought had arisen in Shaparov's mind, it, it might be equally superficial there. Perhaps, said Konyev, but perhaps not. His whole life and mind were bound up in the problems of miniaturization. He would be thinking of nothing else. You keep saying that, said Morrison, but, actually, that is romantic nonsense. No one thinks of nothing else. The most lovesick Romeo in history could not concentrate on his Juliet forever. A twinge of colic, a distant sound, and he would be distracted at once. Nevertheless, we must take anything Shaparov says as possibly significant. Possibly, said Morrison. But what if he were trying to work out the extension of the miniaturization theory and decided to moan he had no time, that there was insufficient time to complete his work? Konyev shook his head, more, it seemed, to brush off distraction than in a clear negative. He said, how about this? What if it seemed to Shaparov that any miniaturization that involved an increase in the speed of light proportional to the decrease in Planck's constant would involve a change that was instantaneous, that took no time? And, of course, as the speed of light increased vastly, so would the inevitable speed of a massless, or nearly massless, object. He would, in effect, abolish time and could say to himself proudly, there is no time. Boronova said, very far-fetched. Of course, said Konyev, but worth thinking about. We must record every impression we get, however dim, however apparently meaningless. I plan to do precisely that, Yuri, said Boronova. Konyev said, then quiet again. Let's see if we can get anything more. Morrison concentrated fiercely, his eyes half buried under jutting eyebrows, but those same eyes were fixed on Konyev, who sighed and said in a whisper, I get something over and over. New time C equals M sub S. Morrison said, I got that, too, but I thought it was M times C square. No, said Konyev tightly. Try again. Morrison concentrated, then, quite abashed, said, you're right. I get it, too. New time C equals M sub S what does it mean? Who can say at first glance? However, if this is in Shaparov's mind, it means something. We can assume that nu is radiational frequency, C the speed of light, and M sub S is the standard mass. That is, the mass at rest under ordinary conditions. In the light of Dash Boronova's arms lifted with an admonitory forefinger upraised. Konyev stopped short and said uncomfortably, but that is neither here nor there. Morrison grinned, classified material, eh, Yuri. And then Dezhnyov's voice sounded with an unaccustomed petulance to it. How is it, he said that you are hearing all these things about time and standard mass and what not and I sense nothing. Is it that I am not a scientist? Morrison said, I doubt that that has anything to do with it. Brains are different. Maybe they come in different types the way blood does. Blood is blood but you can't always transfuse one person's blood into another. Your brain may be sufficiently different from Shaparov's so that there is no sensory crossover. Only mine. Not only yours. There may be billions of minds that can pick up nothing from Shaparov. You'll notice that Sofia and Natalia can pick up the same things, which Yuri and I cannot. And vice versa. Two men and two women, Grump Dezhnyov, and I am what? Konyev said impatiently, you are wasting our time, Arkady. Let's not endlessly discuss every tiny thing we pick up. We have more to hear and little time to do it in. If you concentrate a little harder, Arkady, you, too, may sense something. Silence. 
it was broken occasionally by a soft murmur from one or another who reported sensing an image or a scrap of words. Dezhnyov contributed only one thing. I sense a feeling of hunger, but it may be my own. Undoubtedly, said Boronova dryly. Console yourself with the thought, Arkady, that when we get out of here, you will be allowed seconds and thirds of every dish and unlimited vodka. Dezhnyov grinned almost lasciviously at the thought. Morrison said, we don't seem to come across anything mathematical or even out of the ordinary. I insist that even Shaparov must have the great majority of his thoughts concerned with trivia. Nevertheless, grunted Konyev under his breath, we listen. For how long, Yuri? Till the end of the axon. Right down to the end. Morrison said, do you then intend to run into the synapses or will you double back? We will go as close to the synapses as possible. That will bring us into the immediate neighborhood of the adjoining nerve cell and the skeptic waves may be even more easily sensed at that crucial point of transfer than anywhere else. Dezhnyov said, yes, Yuri, but you are not the captain. Natasha, little flower, is that what you wish? Two. Boronova said, why not? Yuri is right. The synapse is a unique spot and we know nothing about it. I ask only because half our power supply has now been consumed. How long dare we continue to remain within the body? Long enough, said Boronova, to reach the synapse, certainly. And silence fell once more. 63. The ship continued to move along the enormous length of the axon and Konyev dictated the actions of the others more and more. Whatever you get, report. It doesn't matter whether it makes sense or not, whether it's one word or a paragraph. If it's an image, describe it. Even if you think it's your own thought, report it if there's the slightest doubt. You'll have meaningless chatter, said Dezhnyov apparently still annoyed at his non-receiving brain. Of course, but two or three meaningful hints will pay all. And we won't know what's meaningful until we examine everything. Dezhnyov said, if I sense something I think isn't mine, do I throw it in, too? You, especially, said Konyev. If you're as insensitive as you seem to think, anything you do get may be particularly important. Now, please, no more talk. Every second of conversation may mean we miss something. And there began a period of disjointed phrases out of which, in Morrison's opinion, it was impossible to make sense. One surprise came when Kahinan said suddenly, Nobel Prize. Konyev looked up sharply and almost responded. Then, as though realizing who had said it, he subsided. Morrison said, trying not to sound mocking, did you get that, too, Yuri? Konyev nodded. At almost the same time. That's the first crossover between a man and woman, said Morrison. I suppose Shaparov had his mind on it in connection with his extension of miniaturization theory. Undoubtedly. But his Nobel Prize was sure for what he had already done in miniaturization which is classified and therefore unknown. Yes. But once we perfect the process, it will no longer be unknown. Let's hope so, said Morrison sardonically. Konyev snapped, we are no more secretive than you Americans. All right. I'm not arguing, but Morrison grinned broadly at Konyev, who was peering over his shoulder at him, and that seemed to irritate the younger man even further. At one point, Dezhnyov said, Hawking. Morrison's eyebrows lifted in surprise. He had not expected this. Boronova said, looking displeased, What is this, Arkady? I said, Hawking, said Dezhnyov defensively. Out of nowhere it popped into my mind. You told me to tell you anything that did. It is an English word, said Boronova, that means spitting. Or selling, 
said Morrison cheerfully. Dezhnyov said, I don't know enough English to know that word. I thought it was someone's name. So it was, said Konyev uncomfortably. Stephen Hawking. He was a great English theoretical physicist of over a century ago. I was thinking of him, too, but I thought it was my own thought. Morrison said, Good, Arkady. That might be useful. Dezhnyov's face split with a grin. I'm not altogether useless, then. As my father used to say, If the words of a wise man are few, they are nevertheless worth listening to. An interminable half hour later, Morrison said gently, Are we getting anywhere at all? It seems to me that most of the phrases and images tell us nothing. Nobel Prize tells us, reasonably enough, that Shaparov thought of winning one, but we know that. Hawking tells us that that physicist's work was significant, perhaps, in connection with the extension of miniaturization, but it doesn't tell us why. It was not Konyev who rose to the defense, as Morrison would have expected, but Boronova. Konyev, who might have been readying himself for a response, seemed willing, on this occasion, to let the captain bear the weight. Boronova said, We are dealing with an enormous cryptogram, Albert. Shaparov is a man in a coma and his brain is not thinking in a disciplined or orderly fashion. It is sparking wildly, those parts of it that remain whole, perhaps randomly. We collect everything without distinction and it will all be studied by those of us with a deep understanding of miniaturization theory. They may see meaning where you see none. And a bit of meaning, in one corner of the field, may be the start of an illumination that will spread to all parts of it. What we are doing makes sense and it is the proper thing to do. Konyev then said, Besides, Albert, there is something else we can try. We are approaching a synapse. This axon will end eventually and split up into many fibers, each of which will approach but not join with the dendrite of a neighboring neuron. I know that, said Morrison impatiently. The nerve impulse, including the skeptic waves, will have to jump the tiny gap of the synapse and, in doing so, the dominant thoughts will be less attenuated than the others. In short, if we jump the synapse, too, we will reach a region where we may, for a while at least, detect what we want to hear with less interference from trivial noise. Really? Asked Morrison archly. This notion of differential attenuation is new to me. It's the result of painstaking Soviet work in the area. Ah! Kanya fired up at once, what do you mean, ah? Is that a dismissal of the value of the work? No, no. Of course it is. If it's Soviet work, it means nothing. I just mean that I haven't read or heard anything about it, Morrison said in defense. The work was done by Madame Nastya Spenskia. I presume you've heard of her. Yes, I have. But you don't read her papers, is that it? Yuri, I can't keep up with the English language literature, let alone with. Dash well, when this is over, I'll see that you get a collection of her papers and you may educate yourself. Thank you, but may I say that on the face of it I think the finding is an unlikely one. If some types of mental activity survive a synapse better than others, then considering that there are many hundreds of billions of synapses in the brain, all constantly in use, the final result would be that only a tiny proportion of thoughts would survive at all. It's not as simple as that, said Konyev. The trivial thoughts are not wiped out. They continue at a lower level of intensity and don't decline indefinitely. It's just that, in the immediate neighborhood of a synapse, the important thoughts are, for a time, relatively strengthened. Is there evidence for this? Or is it only a suggestion? There's evidence of a subtle nature. Eventually, with miniaturization experiments, that evidence will be hardened, I'm sure. 
there are some people among whom this synapse effect is much stronger than average. Why else can creative individuals concentrate so hard and so long, if they are not less distracted by trivia? And why, on the contrary, are brilliant scholars traditionally absent-minded? Very well. If we find something, I won't quarrel with the rationale. Dezhnyov said, but what happens when we come to the end of the axon? The stream of fluid we're riding will just make a U-turn at that point and carry us back again against the opposite wall of the axon. Do I force my way through the membrane? No, said Konyev. Of course not. We'd damage the cell. We'll have to take on the electric charge pattern of acetylcholine. That carries the nerve impulse pattern across the synapse. Boronova said, Sophia, you can give the ship an acetylcholine pattern, can't you? I can, said Kahinen, but aren't the acetylcholine molecules active on the outside of the cell? Nevertheless, the cell may have a mechanism for ejecting them. We'll try. And the trip along the seemingly endless axon continued. 64. Suddenly the end of the axon was in sight. There was no hint, no warning. Konyev noticed it first. He was watching and he knew what he was watching for, but Morrison gave him full credit. He himself was watching, too, and knew what he was watching for, and yet did not see it when it came. To be sure, Konyev was in the front seat, while Morrison had to stare past Konyev's head. That was not much of an excuse either. In the curiously ineffective light of the ship's beacon, it was clear that there was a hollow ahead and yet the current was beginning to veer away from it. The axon was beginning to break off into branches, into dendrites like those at the other end of the neuron, at the end where the nucleated cell body was. The axonion dendrites at the far end of the cell were fewer and thinner, but they were there. Undoubtedly, a portion of the cellular stream flowed into it but the ship was in the main stream that curved away and they could take no chances. They would have to push into the first dendrite encountered. If it could be done. There, Arkady, there, cried Konyev, pointing, and it was only then that all the rest realized they were reaching the end of the axon. Use your motors, Arkady, and push over. Morrison could make out the soft throbbing of the motors as they edged the ship toward the side of the stream. The dendrite toward which they aimed was a tube that was slipping sideways, a huge tube at their size scale, so huge they could only see a small arc of its circumference. They continued to edge closer to it and Morrison found himself leaning toward the dendrite, as though adding body English could improve matters. But it was not a matter of reaching the tube itself merely moving over an eddying section of fluid, a rushing of water molecules that quieted into gentle circles and then slipped beyond into another stream that was curving off in another direction. The ship made the transition and was suddenly plunging forward into the tube opening. Turn off the motors, said Konyev excitedly. Not yet, grumbled Dezhnyov. We may be too near the countercurrent emerging from this thing. Let me slip over a bit closer to the wall. He did so, but that did not take long. They were now essentially moving with the current, not against it. And when Dezhnyov did finally shut off the engine and pushed back his damp, graying hair, he heaved a great breath and said, Everything we do consumes a ton of energy. There's a limit, Yuri, there's a limit. We'll worry about that later said Konyev impatiently. Will we? said Dezhnyov. My father always said. Later is usually too late. Natalia, don't leave all this to Yuri. I don't trust his attitude toward our energy supply. Calm yourself, Arkady. I will take care to override Yuri if it becomes necessary. Yuri, the dendrite is not very long, is it? We will come to the ending in short order, Natalia. In that case, Sophia, 
please see to it that we are ready to adopt the acetylcholine pattern at a moment's notice. You'll give me the signal, then. Said Kahinan. I will not have to, Sophia. I'm sure that Yuri will hoop like a Cossack when the end is in sight. Shift the pattern to acetylcholine at that moment. They continued sliding along the final tubular remnant of the neuron they had entered a considerable time before. It seemed to Morrison that, as the dendrite continued to narrow, he could see the wall arc above him, but that was illusion. Common sense told him that even at its narrowest, the tube would appear to be a few kilometers across at their present molecular size. And, as Boronova had foreseen, Konyev lifted his voice in a great cry, probably quite unaware that he was doing so. The end is ahead. Quick! Acetylcholine before we're swept around and back. Kahinan's fingers flickered over the keyboard. There was no indication from inside the ship that anything about it had changed, but somewhere up ahead was an acetylcholine receptor. Or, more likely, hundreds of them. And the patterns meshed, positive to negative and negative to positive, so that the attraction between ship and receptor was sharp and great. They were pulled out of the stream and melted into and through the wall of the dendrite. For a few minutes they continued to be pulled through the intercellular medium between the dendrite of the neuron they had just left and the dendrite of the neighbor neuron. Morrison saw almost nothing. The ship, he felt, was sliding along. Or through. A complex protein molecule and then he noticed the formation of a concavity, as when the ship had first entered the first neuron. Konyev had unclasped himself so that he could stand up. Quite obviously, he was too excited to feel this was something he could do sitting down. He said, almost stuttering, now, according to the Nastyaspenskia hypothesis, the filtering out of the important thoughts is most evident immediately after the synapse. Once the cell body is approached, the difference fades. So once we are in the neighboring dendrite, open your minds. Be ready for anything. Say whatever you hear out loud. Describe any images. I'll record everything. You, too, Arkady. Albert, you, too. We're in now. Begin. Fifteen. Alone. Good company robs even death of some of its terrors. Dezhnyov Sr. 65. Morrison watched what followed with a certain detachment. He did not intend to participate actively. If something forced itself into his mind, he would respond and report it. It would be unscientific not to. Kahinan, at his left, looked grim and her fingers were idle. He leaned toward her and whispered, Have you got us back as L-glucose? She nodded. He said, Are you aware of this Nastyaspenskia hypothesis? She said, it's not in my field. I've never heard of it. Do you believe it? But Kahinan was not to be trapped. She said, I'm not qualified either to believe or disbelieve, but he believes it. Because he wants to. Do you sense anything? Nothing more than before. Dezhnyov was, of course, silent. Boronova occasionally produced a crisp word or two which, however, seemed to Morrison's ears to lack conviction. Only Konyev seemed to maintain enthusiasm. At one point, he cried out, Did anyone get that? Anyone? Circular rhythm. Circular rhythm. There was no direct answer and, after a while, Morrison said, What does that mean, Yuri? Konyev did not answer. And even he grew quiet after a while and was reduced to staring blankly ahead as the ship moved onward in the fluid stream. Boronova asked, Well, Yuri. Konyev said rather hoarsely, I do not understand it. Dezhnyov said, Yuri, little son, it may be this is a bad neuron and isn't doing much thinking. We'll have to try another and maybe another. 
The first one may have been simply beginner's luck. Konyev looked at him angrily. We don't work with single cells. We're in a group of cells. A million of them or more. That are a center of creative thought by Albert's theory. What one of them thinks, they all think. With minor variations. Morrison said, that's what I believe I have shown. Dezhnyov said, then we don't go looking from cell to cell. It would be no use, said Morrison. Good, said Dezhnyov heavily, because we don't have the time and we don't have the energy. So what do we do now? In the silence that followed, Konyev said again, I do not understand it. Nastya Spenskia could not be wrong. And now Kahinan, with great deliberation, unclasped herself and stood up. She said, I want to say something and I don't want to be interrupted. Natalia, listen to me. We have gone far enough. This is an experiment that perhaps had to be done, even though, in my opinion, it was sure to fail. Well, it has failed. She pointed a slim finger briefly at Konyev, without looking at him. Some people want to alter the universe to their liking. Whatever is not so, they would make so by sheer force of will. Except that the universe is beyond any person's will, squeeze he ever so hard. I don't know if Nastya Spenskia is correct or not. I don't know if Albert's theories are correct or not. But this I know what they think, and what any neuroscientist thinks about the brain generally, must be about a reasonably normal brain. Academician Shaparov's brain is not reasonably normal. 20% of it is non-functioning dead. The rest must be distorted in consequence and the fact that he has been in a coma for weeks shows that. Any reasonable human being would realize that Shaparov cannot be thinking in normal fashion. His brain is an army in. In disarray. It is a factory in which all the equipment has been jared loose. It is sparking randomly, emitting broken thoughts, scattered pieces, splinters of memory. Some men. She pointed again. Won't admit it because they believe that if they only insist loudly enough and strongly enough, the obvious will retreat and the impossible will somehow come into being. Konyev had now also unclasped and was also standing. He turned slowly and looked at Kahinan. Morrison was astonished. Konyev was actually looking at her. And on his face there was no visible sign of anger or hatred or contempt. It was a hangdog look, with a touch of self-contempt in it. Morrison felt sure of this. Yet Konyev's voice was steady and hard as he looked away from Kahinan and turned to Boronova, addressing her. Natalia, was this point made before we embarked on this voyage? If you mean, Yuri, did Sophia say all this to me before this moment? She did not. Is there any reason we should be plagued with crew members who have no faith in our work? Why should such a person have agreed to come on this voyage? Because I am a scientist, shot back Kahinan and she, too, addressed Boronova. Because I wanted to test the effect of artificial electrical patterns on biochemical interaction. That has been done, so that for me the voyage was a success, and for Arkady, since the ship has handled as it should, and for Albert, since the evidence for his theories is stronger now, I gather, than it was before we came here. And for you, Natalia, since you brought us down here and, presumably, will bring us back safely again. But for one. Pointing at Konyev. It has been a failure and the mental stability of he who has failed would be greatly helped by the frank admission of that failure. She's getting back at him with a vengeance, thought Morrison. But Konyev did not crumple under Kahinan's forceful attack. He remained surprisingly calm and he said, still to Boronova, that is not so. That is the reverse of what is true. It was clear from the start that we could not expect Shaparov to think as he did when he was in full health. 
it was entirely likely we would get bits and pieces of meaning intermingled with meaninglessness and trivialities. That we did. I was hoping to get a higher percentage of meaning in this new neuron immediately past the synapse. There we failed. That makes the task before us more difficult, but not impossible. We've got well over a hundred phrases and images we've salvaged from Shaparov's thinking. Don't forget new times c equals m sub s, which must be significant. There's no possible reason to think of that simply as a triviality. Boronova said, Have you thought, Yuri, that it is possible that that fragment of a mathematical expression represents something Shaparov tried and found wanting? I have thought of it, but why should it stick in his mind, in that case? It is certainly worth investigating. And how much of what seems to be trivial or meaningless would not be so if even one phrase or image gave us a necessary hint? With each step forward, other things might more easily fall into place. We certainly have no reason as yet to declare this voyage a failure. Or any part in it. Boronova nodded slightly. Well, let's hope you're right, Yuri, but, as Arkady has already asked, what do we do now? What, in your opinion, ought we to do now? With great deliberation, Konyev said, there's one thing we haven't tried yet. We've tried detection outside the neuron, inside the neuron, inside the axon, inside the dendrites, past the synapse, but, in every single case, we have tried it inside the ship, inside its presumably insulating walls. In that case, then, said Boronova, are you suggesting that we make the attempt outside the ship and within the cell fluid itself? Remember, such an observer would still be inside a plastic suit. A plastic suit is not as thick as a plastic ship and the insulating effect would presumably be less. Besides, the computer itself need not be inside the suit. Morrison said with gathering alarm. Who do you have in mind for this? Konyev looked at him coolly. There is only one possibility, Albert. The computer is your design and is made to match your brain. You are, of necessity, the most sensitive to Shaparov's thoughts. It would be foolish in the highest degree to send out anyone else. I have you in mind for this, Albert. 66 Morrison's stomach clenched tightly. Not that. He couldn't be asked to do it again. He tried to say so, but his mouth seemed to have dried completely and instantaneously and he could make no sound other than a throaty hiss. It flashed through his mind that he had been beginning to enjoy the feeling of not being a coward, of wandering, by ship, through the brain cell fearlessly. But he was a coward, after all. Not that. He cried out, but it wasn't his voice, it was higher by an octave. It was Kahinan. She had turned around to face Boronova, holding herself down in her seat with knuckles standing out whitely. Not that, Natalia, she cried again passionately, her chest heaving in excitement. It's a cowardly suggestion. Poor Albert has been out there once already. He nearly died and if it hadn't been for him we might still be lost in the wrong capillary and we might never have reached this cell block at all. Why should he have to do that again? It is surely someone else's turn and since he wants it done. No one questioned who he was. Let him do it. He should not ask it of someone else. Morrison, beneath his own fright wondered faintly if Kahinan's emotion was due to a growing affection for him or a determination to oppose at every point any strong wish of Konyev's. There was a corner of Morrison's mind that was pragmatic enough to be certain it was the latter. Konyev's face had grown slowly redder as Sophia spoke. He said, there's no cowardice here. He spat out the word, making it quite plain that that was what had most offended him. I am making the only possible suggestion. If I go out there, which I am perfectly willing to do, it can only be with Albert's device, which won't work as well for me as it would for him. 
We cannot choose this one or that one according to whim. It must be the one who can get the best results and there is no question, in that case, who it must be. True, said Morrison, finding his voice now, but there is no reason to suppose that reception will be better outside the ship than inside. Konyev said, there is no reason to think the reverse, either. And as Dezhnyov will tell you, our energy supply, and therefore our time, is decreasing. There is no room for delay. You'll have to leave the ship as you did before. And now, Morrison said in a low voice, which he hoped would make the remark final, I'm sorry. I will not leave the ship. But Boronova had apparently made up her mind. I'm afraid you'll have to, Albert, she said gently. No. Yuri is right. Only you and your device can give us the information we need. I am certain there'll be no information. Boronova held out her two hands, palms upward. Perhaps not, but we can't leave that a matter of conjecture. Let us find out. But... Dash Boronova said, Albert, I promise you that if you do this one thing for us, your part in all this will be reported honestly when the time comes for open publication. You will be known as the man who worked out the correct theory of thought, the man who developed the device that could exploit that theory properly, the man who saved the ship in the capillary, and the man who detected Shaparov's thinking by bravely venturing into the neuron, as earlier he had ventured into the bloodstream. Are you implying that the truth will not be told if I refuse? Boronova sighed. You force me to play the role of villainous openly. I would rather you had been satisfied with the implication. Yes, the truth need not be told. That, after all, is the only weapon I hold against you. We cannot very well turn you out of the ship by force, since there is no advantage in your merely being outside. You must also sense poor Shaparov's thought and for that we must have your willing cooperation. We will reward you for that, but only for that. Morrison looked around at his crewmates' faces, searching for help. Boronova. Steadily studying him. Konyev. Staring him down imperiously. Dezhnyov. Looking awkward, not willing to commit himself either way. And Kahinan. His only hope. Morrison gazed at her thoughtfully and said, What do you think, Sophia? Kahinan hesitated, then said in a voice that did not tremble, I think it is wrong to threaten you in this way. A task like this should be performed voluntarily and not under duress. Dezhnyov, who had been humming very softly to himself, now said, My old father used to say, Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.